Everybody, welcome to the show, the VPZD show, episode 16, VP, In person welcome. this time. We're doing it in person. Might be the second or third time it's been in person. That's right, yeah. because we don't believe that COVID is going to stop us from being us. We're like Laverne and Shirley. That's how old I am. Yeah, we didn't believe it a while back, but now I think many people don't believe it. <laughs> you yeah, know what's funny? Okay, this not yet. believing it a while back stuff. So you and I have been saying this thing, but like, hey, this isn't it. This, is, this thing is with us forever. We've got deer with COVID. Right. Unless you want to murder all the deer, you're never going to have zero COVID. <laughs> well, don't tell Tattoo China because they might do it. They're already going after pets and such. We'll talk about that. Sh- oh, we'll Sh- have to talk about Shanghai. Oh, yeah, yeah Shanghai. Yeah. Um, they're doing really great, I understand. Yes. Uh, but this mm-hmm. idea that, hey, we've been saying this, and then um, someone like Lena, Lena Wen says it, and Stat News runs an article saying, controversial comments from <laughs> Lena Wen. I'm like, we've been saying this shit from the beginning. Yeah, I mean, it's been obvious, I think, since uh, even 2020. We, I think, um, were, um, I think, embracing of sort of a, um, a balanced perspective until vaccination. But after vaccination, I think we were sort of on the page of, you know, when are you going to get back to life and what, what are we going to, you know, what are we waiting for? And now she's come along, I think in 2022, that was when, that was when she, you know, switched sides, so to speak. <laughs> And, uh, you know, getting a lot of heat for it, I guess, because she's out there on CNN, you know, but she is taking fire because she's on that channel that is a COVIDian channel. Oh, yeah. And she is putting this message out there. And so I see her on the Internet. She's taking a lot of I gotta lot give, of heat. I'll give her props for uh, taking the heat that we've been taking for <laughs> <laughs> infinite years. I was like, oh, it feels nice and cool now. Yes, it does. <laughs> nice she and cool. Sucked some of the, she's like a heat pump. She yeah. sucked some of that heat and sucks the evacuated anger. it into CNN for us. But you know what? One thing some doctor told me, uh, he messaged me and said, you know, look at the, w- the response she's getting. It's not about what she's saying because what she's saying is actually quite sensible, which is that, you know, you've been vaccinated, you've been boosted. We yeah. all have to get back with life and this virus is not going to go anywhere, which is what we've been saying for about a year. Yep. Um, she's saying something very sensible and if you look at the response, even from other doctors, people People aren't saying, oh, actually, the virus can be eradicated or actually, I disagree with you. We should just wait for that fifth booster or sixth booster. They're not saying sort of what their position is. They're just making memes about her. Yeah. You know, they're targeting her. They're, they're just sort of general nasty comments about her, you know, and, and you know, we've gotten a little bit of that. So have a lot of people. But it just shows you that, you know, even very well educated people cannot engage on the merits of the argument. They make it about her. Yeah. And especially educated people, I feel like they almost weaponize their own um, petty insecurities and uh, weird personality quirks in, in a setting. I mean, you look, 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 we both went to medical school. What percentage of your classmates were clinically insane? I mean, like, <laughs> and I put myself in this category. Uh-huh. I mean, these are not normal people. I mean, to some degree, I think you make a great point, which is that, you know, the thing you're selecting for is somebody who at a very young age decided they're going to put their nose to the grindstone yeah. and give up a lot of, you know, sort of normal things you do when you're young uh, in order to pursue this this craft. And so by definition, you're going to get some people who are a little bit wacky, a little wacky, but they are acting like uh, high school bullies or middle school actually not even high school no, middle school middle yeah. school high, yeah. by high school you figured okay i have this fake identity and i'm gonna yeah. roll with it middle school you're still trying to figure it out so the bullying and the weirdness and all that other stuff just comes out it comes out maybe right. social media disinhibits them and makes them uh, re- uh, regresses them i think social media is a big piece of it because it does hijack right into our limbic system it plugs right into the to the like the matrix it's right there right in there and it just rewards all this shitty behavior yeah, it does. yeah you know and t- twitter's really good at that what do you think of elon musk trying to uh, hostile, buy Twitter. yeah, buy Twitter. I see that's also divided Twitter. Of should, course. He, should he buy Twitter? Well, you know, I guess, um, <laughs> I guess I think that, you know, I mean, I don't know everything about what he actually intends on doing, but my general understanding of it, and tell me if I'm wrong, is that he's one of these guys that came out of the original internet where they thought the internet would be really sort of unregulated and free and let people sort of say whatever the hell they want to say mm-hmm. and uh, maybe even be whoever they want to be. Um, then came along sort of internet 2.0 after the dot-com bust and internet 2.0 was about how can we make a lot of money from this thing and making money means collecting information and selling ads and targeting things and making money means that somebody will see you're making tons of money and they may not like the fact that you're allowing sort of all this kind of free-for-all on your platform and they're going to ask you to regulate it. And so I think right now, internet companies are trying to be both like a neutral content, a neutral platform, but also a content regulator. But I think that unfortunately the political left has become a big fan of content regulation, maybe because we happen to be on the political left aligned with the people who run the companies. Because I think if the people who ran the companies were on the right, we wouldn't be so happy about content regulation. Right. And Elon comes along and he sees the content regulation on Twitter. He doesn't like it because he's old school. He wants to buy it and sort of make it what he thinks it should be. I think he's clever in one respect, which is that 
if he made his own platform, it would fail. There right. is a sort of founder effect. They already have the the population of people, so you got to take what's there and make it better. Um, but I think a lot of people, particularly on the political left, don't like the idea that we won't have content regulation. Yeah, I think you're right. And, and Elon is like a bugaboo on the left now. Like he he's somebody that they just don't like. And uh, it's quite fascinating because he, you know, he's gonna, <laughs> just even the threat of this is enough to like, people are like, wait, 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 what? what? Like, and what did he do that earned the ire? What did he do that people on the left don't I like? I think he's just uh, honest and says what he thinks, which mm -hmm. is never a good thing in uh, today's day and age. You just can't do that. You know, when I was talking to somebody and this person's like not a fan of these tech billionaires and uh, arguably I'm not a fan. I'm of not either. Yeah. We're not either, yeah. Um, but we we're talking about Elon and this person was, you know, saying something critical and I said, but you gotta give him one thing, which is this is a guy who actually built some real things. That's, that's see, that's, that's why I often will give Elon a pass, whereas yeah. someone like a Zuckerberg or something like that, it's like, well, he built something that like is kind of vaporware. Yeah. But Elon builds things that move on the road, <laughs> that do stuff, that bring a lot of you know tangible benefits to people. We've both made websites, you know. Dude. <laughs> exactly. And my website, arguably, it's less entertaining than Facebook, but it's also less. It's better for you because yeah. it's not trying to hijack your attention. But Elon made a real thing. He made a real thing, a few real things, right? Real now thing. the sending people in the space thing, I'm not sure that's as beneficial in the in the short run. But I guess I don't know. It's the technology that is involved. Maybe is, it's kind of cool. He wants to get that rocket to land. You know, I, I I agree with you. I'm not sure going into space isn't on my bucket list. Right. You know, I got other places I want to visit exactly. uh, before I go out into the the nothingness like, of like, the void, like of space. like the nothingness of inner space. <laughs> 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 well, I'd rather go on a meditation retreat than, yeah, than the just outer space. Outer space, right. Um, and uh, But, you know, I give him credit. At least that's like a real thing in this world. You can't bullshit your way to space. You know, you have to be, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. It's an engineering problem. You can't bullshit your way to a car, but you can bullshit your way to a, uh, oh, a website. Oh, that's a great way to look at it. I mean, all, in many ways, all this stuff is kind of bullshit wear, right? Except yeah. for the, the tangible stuff. That's why Elon is a little different. And you listen to Elon on, on Rogan, which we can talk about, you know, even Bill Maher on Rogan recently. Yes, we'll talk about but, but Elon on Rogan was a revelation for me because here you see a guy who like he starts to open up and he, I'm like feeling into this guy. He is anxious, he's neurotic, mm. he's like every one of our med school classmates, <laughs> but he's out there doing crazy multi-billion dollar inventing, you know, pushing the envelope of shit. Yeah. And yeah, he's gonna come with baggage. If yes. you think that doesn't come with baggage, like, but what about the current Twitter infrastructure? You think that has no baggage? It's got oh, a lot of baggage. Dude. You've got the founder who's stepped out. You've got this new person appointed. This new person is, by all accounts, happy to like stifle things that he doesn't believe are appropriate. Mm. And you just have these tech companies, like they're one, they're less than a year from when they said you couldn't talk about lab leak. I mean, yeah, well, <laughs> what a colossal screw up. And yeah. now they want to talk about content moderation. You just screwed that up. Yeah, it, 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 you can't, you can't. They can't be trusted to do can't that. Trust I mean, you know, they're. Practically nation state actors now in terms yeah, of the right. size and the influence Wealth that they and have. Influence. Wealth. You know, the Chinese do it with an autocracy. These guys do it with this, you know, because they control conversations. You, if, if you're shadow banned on one of these platforms, you know, you're, you're effectively dead. Yeah. The algorithm pretty much determines your reach and influence. And, and so Mar on Rogan. Yeah. I didn't see it. Oh, I listened to it. Um, um, on on the Spotify app, which by the way is the worst app. Oh, it's, it's the, the worst, worst app. It's the worst app. Stop like five times, and I downloaded the episode. Why is it stopping? I don't know why we're we're on Spotify, but it's like I don't listen to us on Spotify. We're not exclusively on Spotify. That's true. We're all over. Although, listen, Spotify for hundred million dollars, we'll be happy to come on. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'd be sold for 10. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100 million. Yeah. There's a company you don't even know who's running it. It's like, I don't even who know. the hell runs Spotify? That's Maybe that's why they couldn't boycott Rogan, because yeah. you don't even know who to send a complaint letter. The right. Letter. Bobby Spotify, the Bobby, uh, CEO yeah, the <laughs> of the Spotify dynasty. Like. <laughs> I listened to um, this episode. It was really, I mean, I mean, they talked about every, so many things, but he had a little segment about medicine, which I thought was very, um, a really good point for a lay person. And Bill is, you know, he's not a doctor. Mm. Um, and the point he was making was that, um, you know, does he believe things that you and I don't believe about what to eat and how to live sort of woohoo, holistic kind of stuff like all Hollywood people? You mean Mar or Rogan? Mar, Mar I think. yeah. Well, and Rogan, of right, course. Both. I mean, he's in the supplement business. Right, right. They had a nice exchange about, what, you know, how do you look like that at 50? And he's like, oh, oh, I'm taking testosterone. Oh, you there know, you go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, um, you know, Mar also has his own health beliefs that I think, you know, you and I wouldn't agree with right. uh, because we study sort of medical science. But 
One thing he said that I think is really good is he said that, you know, when doctors tell you that they know what's best for you, they have to also acknowledge that they just don't know a lot. And yeah. that biomedicine is it's in, in its infancy and that the body to some degree is like the bottom of the ocean. You just haven't explored it all. And I actually think it's profoundly correct. Yes. You know, we, we look at the successes of medicine, antibiotics, stenting for STEMI, and we think, oh, they know it all. But, you know, we have made very modest changes in cancer. And even though we've had some great drugs, there's still, you know, so many people who die untimely of cancer. Mm. There's so many things that we just have barely scratched the surface and even understanding how it works in sickness or in health. And so I think like Bill's point is that if you don't know a lot, you should come with some humility to say, yes, I think, you know, this intervention is it, is it, it might be a net benefit to you. I believe that to be true. Here's the evidence. Um, I do reserve the fact that there are some things I don't know and I don't know about some sort of sequela. Um, for instance, you know, when we had that adenoviral vector vaccine, we didn't know that it'd have VIT, that vaccine induced thrombosis and thrombocytopenia. Um, that was something that surprised people. But the way they were talking about it when it debuted, they didn't say that it could be VIT. You know, they didn't know. Right. You know, so there are things we don't know. And I think he was refreshing to point that out. You know, it's not something that we teach on the wards, actually, humility. Yeah, humility. It, in fact, we teach the opposite on the wards. It's kind of like, oh, we know we can control all the parameters of this hospitalized patient's course. It just test this, do this, tur turn this dial, turn that. And actually, that was the kind of culture of medicine is, no, you are in control. What you need to go in is go, hey, guess what? There's a thing called tincture of time. Mm -hmm. There's a thing called just watch and see mm -hmm. what happens understanding the humility and the fact that we really don't know a lot. Like some of the miracles of medicine are very simple things like epinephrine for anaphylactic shock. Mm. Like that'll save your life. Mm -hmm. Like we don't talk about that enough. Like that'll save your life. And it's a very, it's not a complex, actually it is complex. Right, right, right. But the the intervention is quite simple. Quite simple, yeah. Epinephrine, clamp things down, save your life, right? But the things that are much more complex cancer, uh, heart disease, even like yeah. uh, hypertension, diabetes, yeah. these chronic diseases, obesity, we don't yeah. understand. There are so many dials and so much unknown and so much mind body interface and so much mind environment interface and the biopsychosocial aspect. Uh, so that's something he talks about too, which is that, you know, we in Western medicine, and, you know, I'm as guilty of this as anyone else, you know, we don't put a lot of stock in like your state of thinking and your mental awareness on right. your physical health. But he said, you know, you must acknowledge that you just don't know everything there. And I was like, I guess to be fair, you know, we we don't know what we don't know. Right. Um, we think of the body as a very physical thing and that your emotional states are likely se secondary to it. But I will also say on a caveat, I also see sometimes these things where it's like, um, you know, like among people with cancer, those with more positive thoughts oh, live longer yeah. than those without. Jesus. And I'm like, well, one of the confounding variables is if you have a lot of cancer in your body and it's secreting a ton of, you know, uh, cytokines that might make you feel depressed and yeah. lethargic and it might be the cancer that drives the mood and not the mood that drives the cancer, you know, so. And and, and, and going with that actually, because of this, that conf correlation causation confounding, yes. going with that is this kind of victim shaming that happens in cancer. Oh, if your attitude wasn't positive, you never would have, you know, you, you would have- You wouldn't never have lost the battle. You wouldn't have lost the, the battle, battle with cancer. Come and maybe on. because your mood is so bad, it's really harming your healing. And, you know, people really don't like that. You know, like my friend Rachel Zofnes talks about chronic pain a lot. And yeah. so there is this saying, even in, in Buddhist Zen circles, that, that, that pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional, mm. that it's your mindset state. But her counter to that, which I think is interesting, is that, well, well so now you're stigmatizing people who are suffering because mm -hmm. it's now on them to control the suffering. The truth is some of these things really are very complicated and you do need to acknowledge that uh, it is that way. Yeah, it's a well humility, played. it's a humility it's thing. It's a humility yeah. thing. You know, and like many people, I also, you know, I bristle at that battle metaphor and I don't like right. it. I don't think it's very helpful, um, but there are some people who actually find it helpful, you know? Right. And so who am I to say to those people that, you know, if it's not helpful to, well, if it's helpful to you, then you do it, but it, we shouldn't impose that on someone who doesn't find it helpful. Yeah. Similarly, I'm always intrigued by you know, as people have advanced cancer, they often feel the desire to eat less. And we do so, so much to try to get them to eat more, including drug development that's pushing, you know, so many com putative compounds to increase appetite, et cetera. And sometimes I wonder if like, I don't know, are we doing somebody, are we actually like benefiting them? And like we have observational studies that show that like, yes, people who lose more weight are more likely to die in the short term, yes. But that's different than the claim of if you take someone who's losing weight and you spoon feed them or really sort of, you know, harp on them to eat more, do you actually extend their life and do you improve their quality of life? Or, you know, nobody likes somebody telling you what to eat, you know, or to eat more, eat more. 
Ah, oh, this is key, man, because I, I you see this in not just in cancer, yeah. but in uh, uh, patients with dementia or mm -hmm. uh, elderly patients who just are starting to lose weight and so on. And and that weight loss may well be an epiphenomenon of an inevitable decline in other things. But the sense of control on the family's part in particular is that, oh, if I just, okay, you got to eat. What is wrong with you? It's like you an Indian grandmother eat. when you're a kid. Oh, totally. I'll Always trying to get you to eat more. You, if you're not, eat the gulab jamun. <laughs> have a sweet. <laughs> you know, anything. And anything. I was like, I don't have enough metformin to eat that yeah, gulab jamun. Yeah, exactly. Come on, <laughs> I need dude. A like, pen insulin to eat is so expensive right now. <laughs> yeah, it, it, but it really is. A, there's this kind of idea that yeah. we, again, gets back to humility, this sense of control. Really, like, you know, the deepest, and again, I hate to sidetrack it on this, but the deepest spiritual teachings are always that you have no control. Mm -hmm. Like, actually accepting this present moment as it is gives you a weird paradoxical control because you allow life to show you what's actually supposed to happen. And in medicine, you can do medicine, you can practice amazing medicine and still have that philosophy that like, wow, no, actually this system that's so complex that interacts with everything around it actually is to be respected. And what we do is we are kind of part of the inevitable unfolding of that. But right. the humility required to, to do that. You know, where it would have been useful, I think like two things. One, the Human Genome Project. Oh, you know, yeah. Francis Collins himself wrote a paper that said, by 2015, you'll go to the doctor and they'll sequence you and they'll tell you which blood pressure medicine is right for you. Uh -huh. Well, 2015 came and went and we didn't do that. Yep. Because of course the genome wasn't giving us all the information we thought it might. And the more I think about it now, I feel like the genome is like, you know, in the Plato's allegory of the cave, the yeah. prisoners are chained to the cave yeah. and there's a fire behind them and they only see their own shadows. And Plato asks, what would your perception of the world be if you've only seen your shadow and then one day somebody comes and unshackles you and you're allowed to leave the cave? Similarly, sometimes in biology, I think we're only seeing the shadow, like the sequence of nucleotides when it's in reality a complex three-dimensional thing and, uh, and it doesn't, but it doesn't stop us from thinking we know everything. Dude, that Plato allegory is like the central heart of a lot of like uh, spiritual traditions too, mm. is that this world is an illusion <laughs> to some degree. But what I'd say is this, what, what you may be pointing at is something that say Donald Hoffman, who I've had on my show talks about, what if reality, we just have some amateur error in understanding reality, that we think there's physical stuff that then spins up consciousness and all of that. And, but what if it was actually consciousness is primary and it spins up icons that, that within consciousness look like a physical world. So our science, our medicine, and all of this is, it's like Plato's allegory of the cave. You're moving icons on a desktop, but you're not seeing the zeros and ones underneath. Mm -hmm. And and so we can get very far with that. Like we've gone incredibly far. We have iPhones and all this crazy technology, but there's gonna come a limit. And I think in humans, in the body, that limit is reached faster because this is this oscillating kind of waveform of you know quantum mechanics inter interfacing with consciousness, interfacing with whatever matter is. And we're like, oh, but you can just, there's a receptor and a binding protein right. and a DNA, you know, uh, code for it. Doesn't work that way. You're just seeing shadows. Yeah, not always. And, um, and then the other example I think about is the idea that like all these people are like, oh, it's just more testing. Like if only we had more testing oh, yeah. or if only we had a little bit more antivirals. And I was like, well, you know, it will be, I mean, the antivirals might make a marginal difference. More testing, you know, I'm not sure what you're going to accomplish, you know, anymore when it's just widespread community transmission. But yeah, let's Where talk, do you want to go? The testing let, let, or I want to go to Shanghai. Yeah, go to Shanghai because oh, the, now we're Shanghai. in this like Omicron BA whatever we're in. Oh, yeah, yeah. And Shanghai is a great example of uh, zero COVID gone gone mad. Or gone to its logical conclusion. Yes. This is what these people wanted, Z. Yes. They wanted this. They wouldn't come out and say it. They said, oh, we just need to lock down hard. And the problem in America was, you know, those bad people just didn't do what they're supposed to. They didn't wear their mask and they came out and went on unnecessary- uh, Thanksgiving visits. Thanksgiving visits yeah. and their unessential- uh, travel. So, yeah, unessential travel and unessential social gatherings. Well, China has put an end to all that. 27 million people locked in their houses. Then they realize that, oh, when you lock down, you might not get enough food on the table. People going hungry. No medicines. No medicines. No insulin. No insulin, no food. When you're sick with a non-COVID, they won't even take you in the hospital, I hear. Yeah. I'm reading reports. They have announced that they are changing their policy of the child separation. You read about, but, oh. but I've also read anecdotal accounts that they haven't, even though they said they would. The policy is if you got a two-year-old kid, the kid tests positive, you don't, te you test negative. The kid is being ripped out taken of your house, away taken me. away to central yeah. detention agency. This is insane. Insane. <laughs> it's like something out of like well, an Orwell novel. Actually, actually, let's think about this. Yeah. It's insane from our perspective. Correct. From their perspective of uh, whatever their collectivist perspective is, okay, maybe this all makes sense. 
I don't know because I'm not in that perspective, but either way from a standpoint of objectivity, as much as we can muster, that seems unproductive to me. You know, I do think though, like let's imagine that like it, the reason it, it feels so bad to us is it just fundamentally clashes with our moral intuition that right. no, no matter how bad it gets, you can't do that. You can't separate people um, from their babies. From yeah. And when you see them crying in the streets and, and you know, I heard a grandmother was threatening to commit suicide if they take the child away, mm. you know, all these things that natural in any time in human history through war or famine, if anyone tried to do that to someone's kids, I'm sure they would feel that way. Yeah. Um, and it clashes with our moral intuition, but from the moral intuition that the, the, the good and just thing to do is to minimize COVID-19 spread. So fewer people die and hurt from COVID, the zero COVID philosophy they may argue it is the moral thing to do mm -hmm. because if you had the child at home with you, you could get sick and you could spread it to someone else and it would prolong the pandemic. You know, remember how they kept saying that, you know, this all those bad actors prolong the pandemic. Right, right. Ignoring the fact that we will all eventually get the virus. Yes. So what does it mean to prolong the pandemic? Once you're vaccinated, we're all going to get the virus. That's the best you can do. And I believe Lena, Lena Wen said that. Yeah, recently. Yeah, recently. Only recently, right? <laughs> VPZD 2021, <laughs> Lena Wen 2022. We're the same person. <laughs> In fact, I think I said it in the summer of 2020. You think you were, oh, wow, Because okay. what I said was, yeah. listen, um, I think it's not a bad idea to kind of bend the curve until we yeah. get to a vaccine. But just so you know, everybody's going to get this eventually. You know, we should do a video where we take all our old oh, videos, yeah. you know, and do the react to ourselves. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a great video. And you know what? You'll do much better than I, I'll I don't do. Know. I think you'll do. Well, let's, we should also pick some of the... Um, the people on CNN and stuff and really get and a good laugh and contrast. Oh yeah, they're Ooh, gotta be a hoot. Even oh. Fauci, he'll get oh, decimated. Yeah, 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 that's true. I think he won't do well. <laughs> that, you know what? That's a viral video waiting to happen. And that's it's so much a... work that we won't do it. I know, I don't Yeah, think cause do we're it. just, I don't know, you're busy and I'm lazy. I mean, we'd have to like get the videos, watch them, which right. would take tens oh, of hours. God. Watching ourselves is so much fun. So well, it's yeah. to be avoided. Oh, to, our, to our detractors, they think that's like a paradise for us, <laughs> sitting and watching ourselves. I think like a lot of people, I don't really like to watch myself. It's awkward. Yeah, I don't like it. Yeah. yeah. We um, were just talking about actually, this is a side note, yeah, but, side note, but both of us have changed our style of speaking oh, yeah. on video because we've gotten more comfortable with being ourselves. Mm -hmm. So early videos of both of us, like from years ago for me and you know a year or two ago from you. You've, it, done, it, you've gotten more polished under your belt. Uh, yeah. I'm more, still a rough gem. I'm still... <laughs> You're more of a natural than I'm more I am. Of a natural in finish, the old yeah. days, I was almost playing. I, I often played to the camera and was more of a character and so on. Like I'm talking years ago, yeah. and even and then and then now I'm just because I think I'm in my own space and the isolation of the pandemic too, and not having a team here. It's just I like, feel the same way. I listened to like my first podcast. It's god awful. Like I should oh, put so, off the internet. Not some of my earlier stuff is so embarrassing. And I even had a little like a couple hairs, and I was like, what the hell is this guy? <laughs> You know, I don't like me now, but that guy, holy. <laughs> it's amazing. You know, it's also like, if you ever go back and read emails you wrote like 10 years ago, you're oh. like, who is this loquacious yeah. bastard? Who is this person talking too much? Dude, yeah. I used to write so uh, much and eloquently, but it said nothing. It was all doublespeak. And, and now I'm, my emails are like an emoji. <laughs> Now like, hey. I'm like, yeah, so short. Somebody's like, oh, it's so it's rude to write such short emails. I was like, but it answered the it answered relevant the question. question. Yeah. And uh, I didn't have a, like any more time for that email. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Let's talk about, well, so, so the point on Shanghai, of course, Shanghai, I think, I think the people who supported stronger restrictions, they are getting what they didn't know they wanted with Shanghai. Uh, and I think what it shows is that we could never have done that. Yeah. Because it's human rights violation. It is, it's as simple as that. For, from an American's perspective, probably from an objective perspective, yeah. but- It's a human rights it, violation. It, you know, and it's not gonna accomplish, I mean, what They're we'll gonna, see in the end. They yeah. will lose, I mean, they'll eventually yeah. get completely yeah. swept with the virus. Right. And if they don't, I mean, the real question I have is what the hell have they been doing the last yeah. year now? Vaccinate Where, your population. But are they using Sinovac? I mean, that's kind of their, a- They're their crappy That's vaccine? kind of like a wacky, yeah. I mean, you know, I gotta give I gotta give this to Borla and the gang. Yeah. You know, the mRNA vaccines are, are pretty high quality. You titrate vaccines. that as much as the heart can take. <laughs> <laughs> titrate it to inflammation. Titrate That's what it you want to do. Tropes in, you're good. <laughs> yeah, as soon as you start leaking troponin, <laughs> yeah, that's when you you've hit it. You, you know why? <laughs> that's what we ought to do. Instead of this, like, well, how many boosters is good enough? No, no. Just like, well, no, wait. When you start leaking troponin, when your troponin becomes super therapeutic, then you're at the sweet then spot. Then you're at the yeah. sweet spot. It's all reversible anyway. It's all that yeah, oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is reversible with like five days of hospitalization. Yeah. And but yeah. I mean, it's an effective. I mean, Pfizer, Moderna, the first dose. You know, I'm pretty sold on the first dose for most adults yeah. and yeah. beyond that. We got the questions, but yeah, yeah. I don't know what they're doing in China. Um, yeah. But uh, 
you know, the other thing I learned to say about China was um, the Western world learned about lockdown from China. Right. And it just goes to show you, next time public health people, like don't take cues from totalitarian, totalitarian regimes. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, we learned how to do war from Putin. Oh, you just yeah, go right. in and murder a bunch of civilians, and bury the bodies in mass graves, and then, yeah. Yeah, don't learn from bad actors. Right. That's probably a good, you probably know, good. that's a good, good rule of thumb for Twitter. Yeah. Like why, huh. why should the press be taking screenshots of dipshits Twitter, <laughs> twittering, twatting on Twitter? I mean, I guess like a huge chunk of journalism now is just to talk about what people are saying on the right. social media platform. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, it's nuts. Yeah, it's interesting. I've actually enjoyed reading some of the Ukraine press just because it's different. Like mm. they're not quoting anyone. Oh, they actually do. Well, a Russian foreign minister, blah, 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 said on Telegram today that yeah, yeah. Or all Ukrainians should die. They take, um, and and also since it's clear that like we, our allegiances are with the Ukraine side, which is, I mean, sensible. Sensible. But it doesn't mean that we have to accept everything the Ukrainian government says. That's right. Like, because they also need to put out war propaganda too. Right, right. And so I sometimes see our journalists parroting it. Yeah, it's funny. My mom was actually kind of pissed because um, the Ukrainians were, uh, she, I think there were a lot of Indians in um, Ukraine that were studying medicine at the time of the uh, invasion, and they were treated really badly by the mm -hmm. Ukrainians, according to my mother. <clears throat> and so she took umbrage at that, but then later said, I'm sorry for even taking umbrage at that, seeing how they're being treated by the Russians is just like appalling. So it's kind of like this weird moral conflict. So speaking of which, actually, this might be a good segue into, into a video I did recently about kids, and it was based on an Atlantic oh, yes. article. Anxiety. Yeah. and. Um, it, so kids' mental health has deteriorated if you believe the statistics on it. If you only believe your eyes and ears and all the data, <laughs> yeah, I'll concede and to you. Yeah. Any pediatrician, <laughs> any psychologist, and any parent can tell you. So, you know, my own daughters yeah. tell me oh, all their friends are in guidance counselor's office all the time with anxiety, depression. I, I have relatives that aren't that old, that are young, <clears throat> the late teens that are on, you know, antidepressants and that kind of thing. And, and I remember, look, you know, we had... You and I are frame shifted by about 10 years, but we pretty much had very similar yeah, upbringings, similar right? Similar sort of. Rural, uh, yeah. you kind of did your thing. Parenting was kind of a little hands off. And so the question is, first of all, you have to believe that this is really let's a problem. Let's concede that to be the case. Let's I concede mean, it. Yeah, okay. yeah, let's concede it. Now, I, and you could say, well, the argument is, no, we've just destigmatized it so more people talk about it. No, but- I, Yeah, I, I do think that people have looked at that question and it's beyond what even destigmatized. That's, right. Right. That's yeah. right, because you're seeing actual suicide attempts. You're seeing actual self-harm, cutting and things like that. Um, it's worse in girls. Uh, but guys still suffer from it and so on. It started in about 2009, they started measuring this upstick, which correlates to the development of this. Mm. And the fact that now people can plug right in. Total, total coincidence. coincidence. So there are four things postulated okay, in the yeah, article. Yeah. The first is social media, right? Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. so we know we've talked about social media as a harmful thing, especially for young girls. They commit relational aggression, they have FOMO, they stop socializing in person, which is has been associated with better outcomes. For and I think the reason like so many people find it palatable is that like, I think most of us, when we finish looking at social media, we are more, annoyed than we were when we started. Totally. I mean, I, you know, I'll, I'll be I'll be totally transparent. Like you and I, when we just met today, the, how are you doing Z? I don't know, man. Yeah. I'm just kind of like, whatever. The truth is anytime I get sucked into social media, I get less happy. And anytime I am so busy that I don't even have time to look, I get more happy. You get more happy, me too. So whether I go on a retreat or whether I just forget about it or whatever, I'm better, I'm better. Like the other day, I decided I'm not gonna, I'm doing nothing today except for the, dropping the kids off and I'm gonna meditate. And I meditated for almost six hours. By the end of the day, reality started getting transparent. Like I, it was just this empty awakeness with like vibrating energy. And I'm like, oh, this isn't so bad. The next morning I opened some social media. I decided I was gonna make a video, I did this. And reality clunks itself back on in a way that's very dysphoric. It's very uncomfortable. Mm, you don't have to be that crazy to experience it. But so social media, okay, yeah. Social media is one. Is possible. one yeah. possible thing. Um, two is the media media. So yeah. this idea, and we were talking about this, like kids are obsessed. They have so much access to news now. News <clears throat> has a negativity bias that all they see is the world, the world, the sky is falling. Climate change, political division, Ukraine, nuclear war, environmental destruction, all this stuff. And they take it very seriously because they don't have fully formed frontal lobes yet to understand that. Look, at, I got my own problems. I can't change question. the world. So when you were growing up, did you, I'm trying to think about, did I even watch the news that much? I know. Barely. It, yeah, we'd sometimes put Tom Broca on in the evening, like right around dinner time. 
And uh, but as a, even a high schooler, even a college kid, I have to admit, I hardly. Mean, I mean, the you know, I mean, I kept up a little bit, but I wasn't all up to speed. These kids are jacked into it now because mm. it's in their feed. And okay, so this is where so social media and media media interact yeah. because they get their news through social media. <laughs> so there was a study they did, and I didn't look at the primary data, so it might be bullshit. But they took people off Facebook for four weeks and found a couple things. One is their their knowledge of world events had plummeted, mm. so they actually knew less about the world. Okay. Their subject objective sense of well-being had skyrocketed. Mm, so there's this inverse curve. <laughs> they paid him to stay off or something like something that. Something like that, yeah. yeah, yeah. I vaguely recall. Yeah. And okay, so one, social media. Two, the media. And of course, the media, if it bleeds, it leads. You know, Of course, it's like they go into those kind of dark places because that's what drives attention economy. Yep, that's exactly right. What are the other two? Yeah, so the other two were parenting style. Okay. So this accommodative parenting style where we helicopter our kids, if they're, oh, little Timmy is afraid of dogs. Keep him away from any dogs. Don't let a dog near him instead of exposure therapy was here's a puppy or, to me. Or this peanut allergy thing. The pe all, same uh, thing, okay. same thing. Peanut okay. allergies or bad words that frighten you or bad like words. you use the wrong, in other words, you use the wrong pronoun and now that's a, like a oh, piece of violence. Swear words. You, you, no, no. But if, so, you, if you don't want to hear swear words, don't come around me when I'm assembling furniture. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's going to be some swear words, you know. I'm not, these hands are useless. You know, we, I didn't become a surgeon for a reason, you know. Me too. You know, My hands are truly, they're like dead appendages. They're like two appendices. Like, you know, like you could just remove them and nothing. Sometimes would... when I go to scroll, I get a little twitch in my finger, you know, I can't even do that. <laughs> <laughs> You're so physically incompetent with the fingers that yeah. even scrolling your feed. Even scrolling the feed, I yeah. feel like I can't quite do it. Can't, sometimes you can't click on the, you know, some, I swear to God, maybe it's just me, but sometimes they make those buttons on the app so small and I feel like I can just never hit the right spot on the screen. Yeah. Always a little off. I'm with you, dude. You know, that's a great way to make somebody feel like they're going crazy. Make a program that just wherever they tap, it always just thinks it's like slightly <laughs> off. <laughs> Wouldn't it that, that's, boy, that's, and that's the fourth reason that kids are crazy. Know. <laughs> you know, that's really interesting, actually. That would drive people insane. Okay, so, wait, so the third so, yeah, reason so was, social media, was parenting media, styles. Media, parenting styles. And this has been discussed, I think, in Jonathan Haidt's book, Calling the American, American Mind. Mind. Yeah. So that, that's, that was referenced even in the article. And okay. I think it, it's absolutely must read if, if you're into that, into trying to figure this out. And there was another one and I've already forgotten what the okay. third was, but. Well, that's, a refer that's probably why you're not so anxious. Yeah. And I was also listening to a, a podcast and on this podcast, this young, uh, should I say what it was? It's another Bill Maher podcast. Oh, now, yeah. now I'm gonna look like a big fan, but well, I do like him, but you know, I do think he's a clever person. Um, I think he's somebody who just like didn't go to a lot. I mean, didn't he finish college and then he started working in comedy? Um, but like a lot of comedians, you know, they it's it, they, some of them are very smart and they're very astute about you know social world and what makes people tick. And he was talking to some young person. This young person had a lot of anxiety about you know climate change and things like that. And he was really I could kind of feel in his voice that he's like trying to counsel them, like you know that's not on you. Yeah. Like yes, we all can make sort of environmental choices or not. But in the grand scheme of things, those that moves the needle like this. Governments yeah. have to make big choices yeah. if we're going to make some dent in this. And um, and but moreover, like you shouldn't feel. I mean, you may feel like it's a cause worth pursuing, just like I feel like high cancer drug prices are a cause worth pursuing, and we do have this whole research agenda on it. But I don't, you know, and I'm sympathetic to people who are paying high out of pocket. I feel bad for them. I get angry about it. But I don't let that anxiety come back and paralyze me. And I'm certainly not waking up, you know anxious about this social political issue, I'm trying to think about how to fix the problem. That's right. And this is a part of the distortion of control. Yeah. Like that 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 my individual choices right now are gonna have this massive impact on the on the world and it gives you a sense of responsibility. It really it's it's much more nuanced than that. And that actually reminded me of the third thing oh, okay. or the fourth thing, yeah. which is the the isolation that we've put kids under whether it's oh, pandemic it's or yeah. otherwise. And so they say, oh, they're they're having alone time, but it's alone with phone. So they're not sleeping, they're spending more time with this and less time in person. So they drink less, they DUI less, they, uh, all these things that we would have thought, oh, this is pro less teen pregnancy, all those things are better. And yet their mental health is suffering. Why? Because they're sacrificing the in-person interaction for a fake interaction. Mm -hmm. And so this sense of, of, of loneliness or isolation what did we do in the pandemic? We made it 20 fold worse by closing schools. So you close schools and you put them behind a mask when they are in school and you don't think that's gonna have a consequence 
for developing young people who thrive on social. I mean, the whole idea is during their teens, they get away from their parents and the peer group starts to matter, right? Yeah. But th this has been taken away. Everything's been shifted later. Yeah, I know I totally agree with you. And that's a really astute point. I guess this, oh, I didn't tell you about this before we started, but there's a new study out of hell, out of Finland, and they have a really wonderful- Oh, you mean a future NATO partner of ours now? <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're not, yeah. That's what I hear. Yeah. I guess, of course, they'd be, I'd be nervous too. I would. That's sharing a border sharing practically a border. with Russia, yeah. But they've been invaded before and they pushed, they resisted. Yes, during World War II, I think the, the when the when the Germans in, uh, started fighting the Russians, the Russians had to give up on the war during there. the war in Finland. Yeah. So what I read about Finland was uh, Helsinki and Turka, which is apparently, I hope I pronounced that correctly. It's beautiful. I'm sure some Finn will say that. Um, the no. Finns are, they can get they can get pissy, dude. I've been to Helsinki and yeah. uh, had a lovely time. Helsinki Hematology Day, I think 2018. <laughs> thanks, thanks all for the for the visit. But uh, <laughs> but it was actually a lovely time. But uh, and I took a dip in the in the in the Baltic Sea. Oh, nice! And then I went in the sauna, and uh, and and uh, I could barely take that frigid water. But man. some some of these older people were swimming laps. I oh, swear they, to yeah, God. they're like they're hardy. Oh man, yeah. I go well anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> watch my, that's what I was about to say. Uh, so this is a study: Helsinki versus Turka. In Helsinki, if you're under 12, you're not masking because they follow the WHO to the letter, which is the selective under 12, and they say there's no reason to do it. So under 12, no masks. Good for Helsinki. Wow, that would be anath anathema in this U.S. And 10 to 12 in Turka, they went a little bit more aggressive, and they masked 10 to 12. And they show like a comparison of COVID-19 rates in these two cities. And it has some advantages because culturally, Finland is, you know- Pretty homogenous. Yeah, more yeah. comparable than, than comparing, let's say for instance, Rando City in, in Texas to the Bay Area, where right. it's culturally very different. Um, I don't think masks became as political. You know, they didn't have the the Finnish version of Donald J. Trump not wear one and the anti, you know, DJTs wear them with vigor and, you know, all this stuff. So they don't have all that kind of baggage. And in this study, it shows clearly the cases they were like identical. They rose, they fell, you know, it was all over, but there was like no difference between these two cities in this age group in 10 mm. to 12, even though one had to do it, one didn't. Mm. And we also have the Spanish data. That's a similar kind of thing. Um, it takes advantage of uh, natural experiment that five-year-olds didn't and six-year-olds did, and there was no regression, discontinuity, or step in that. Um, mm. So I think the answer is that I, pro I really think it probably doesn't do much yeah. to have a cloth mask mandate in kids. Yeah. Um, it probably doesn't, well, it certainly doesn't do much in a cloth mask mandate in adults and most of these, and, and to this date in this country, everyone talks about like mask mandates. It's a cloth mask mandate, even to this day on TSA yeah. flight. <clears throat> they're not making yeah. you wear a good mask. Right. That's one. Two, we've had vaccines for over a year. If you yeah. want to get one, you want to get one. Yeah. And then the moment you get off the plane, yeah. It's Mardi Gras. It's free. It's free. It's, free. <laughs> it's a free for all. We've got a thousand people here in this party and there's yeah. this club and there's no, you know. And so, what is this? Uh, I'll come to that, but let's finish on the kid point. <laughs> I think it was stupid um, to mask them. Uh, I think at the minimum, you do a randomized trial so you can sort it out. Uh, but what's going on in New York City? Yeah. This, oh my God, this crazy mayor. They want to put masks on only, only toddlers. toddlers. The only the toddlers. Only toddlers. Toddler. Which. To me. Oh, because they can't be vaccinated. And we talked about this. But but if you're yeah. an unvaccinated six-year-old, you yeah. don't have to wear it. Right. So it's not based on vaccine status. Yeah, and two to four have even lower risk than any other age group and even lower risk than some vaccinated adults mm. who are free to go to like, you know, bars. And this mayor's got the only toddler mask policy. He, he keeps saying it's justified by science, but it must be justified by literally he must have the dumbest, the dumbest advisors to tell him that this is a good idea. Because one, there's the science of it, which is bankrupt. But then there's the politics of it, which I would think would be so bankrupt, you're going to look like such an idiot. Do you think if somebody came to you in the beginning of the pandemic, like, listen here. <laughs> look at this. Look at this. This is the age gradient of risk. I show you right here. It's got you know, so maybe a thousand fold difference in risk. It's, you know, older people not doing so good. Who do you want to? Who do you want to mask up in this? And you're gonna say that two year old. I got <laughs> round up that toddler and slap a cloth, a cloth mask, mask I know. on I this know. kid. Except when they're napping, then they take it off. And oh nap, and right, sleep. so course, that well, that works well. well yeah, Bunch of, of like heavily breathing. Children in, in, a, in, a, in, in an enclosed in a room, room. <laughs> for like an hour. Yeah, right. Okay. So it's a stupid problem. But meanwhile, th that Eric Adams went to that gridiron dinner, yeah. 700 people, you know, um, and it was a super spreader event yep. and he got COVID. Yep. And I was like, this guy, this guy, I thought he was a savvy politician. Yeah. Well, who knows? Maybe he is. Maybe New Yorkers want that. I know, but doesn't he have some grander ambition than just, I, I thought that it's well, always a stepping stone for oh, these it people. Oh, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, 
I don't know, dude. All I know is that's just dumb. That's where science and policy don't even, they don't even intersect. I don't get it. Can you imagine debating this person in a political thing? Like five years from now, when oh, this is all, you know, yeah. when it's really Remember cool that down. time you. Yeah, I'd be like, he'd be like, you know, you, you know, he's like, you, when you ran the state, your deficits were a little bit higher and blah, blah, blah. I was like, dude, you masked two, you masked two year olds <laughs> while you went to a party. Yeah, and got COVID. And got COVID. got COVID. I was like, you want this, you want the guy who he masked the two, by force of law. He didn't even say like, you could if you want. He forced him by law. And and then he like fired this lawyer who wanted to protest. And then he kept saying science, but obviously we all know now that was stupid. You know, you're done. We we are in a world where Senator Dianne Feinstein still is a senator despite having, yeah, okay. you know, but, cognitive difficulty. Yeah. So, I mean, again, we, we're we in a world that doesn't fully make I sense. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. These politicians have such an incumbency that they yeah. can- Yeah, there's a momentum. Well, you know what? If, if these people pull off this stunt, I will, a little bet. I will buy you a beer. Ooh. If here's my claim. Any politician who is in a photograph that was widely disseminated where they are unmasked and the kiddos are all masked, the Stacey Abrams photos, you know, these kind yeah. of photos, that Kathy from New York State, the governor, um, or any politician that had a totally stupid mandate like this, the toddler mask mandate, I think in five to ten years, they have uh nearly no chance. I'll say this. In the absence of an absolutely crazy candidate on the other side, <laughs> <laughs> they will lose. Uh, you think they'll triumph? Uh, I hope so. There should be karma for that. Oh, you hope that they lose? I hope they yeah, lose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's insane. Do you see how Trump uh, endorsed our boy, Dr. Oz? Yeah, I see that he's gone. He's gone for Oz. <laughs> he said, he's, you know, people, middle aged housewives really trust this guy. Like, that was like. <laughs> I thought he said something like he'd been on TV yeah, for 10 years TV. and he had the top ratings. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it was. Uh, I, how's he doing? I heard he was not doing so well. I haven't kept up on yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. I thought he would do well because I, I thought I name too. recognition would be a lot. Yeah. But I think people. Pennsylvanians see through the charlatan in that. Maybe the thing that irritates them most is that he's like a New Jersey carpetbagger. You know? Yeah, I yeah, know. yeah. I mean, that's. I mean, I'm a New Jersey carpetbagger. I mean, I was born in uh, Morristown, New Jersey. I see, but yeah. then you have Central Valley cred. That's right. So you can carpet bag to, from a shithole to a shithole. <laughs> <laughs> that's an equal it's exchange. It's an equal. Yeah, an equal that's exchange. okay. Yeah. So okay, we talked about. Um, oh, the airplane travel mask. We could. You want to go into that? Oh, yeah. Beat yeah. Down. I mean, yeah. I think so it's stupid. They were going to get rid of travel mask uh, requirements on public transport, but then they decided not to. Yeah. And then somebody was like, um, somebody put this well. They were like, um, they were like, oh, you know, this is to protect act people. And then some, and then there's an equity issue here. Like the people who have to use public transport have no choice. And then they're like, it's actually the other way around that rich people get to go in a way that they don't have to wear the mask all the time. And poor yeah. people have to travel on like buses and trains and planes. That's and right. They have to. That's but right. But I mean, the simple point is that like, what, what is the, I mean, what is their logic? You have a situation right now where you're getting like pre Omicron zero prevalence was 140 million Americans. Yeah. Plus like 200 million Americans have been vaccinated. 250 million Americans have been vaccinated. So you combine like vaccinated plus people who have had COVID plus people who are vaccinated and had COVID. And you're talking, and then you look at what people, what's going on. And it's like Mardi Gras all over the yeah, place. It's over. just like parties all the time. And then you think to yourself, I want a slow spread by putting a mask mandate only in one tiny place with a mask that doesn't work. Yep. While what is the goal? And everyone they're going to get it eventually. They're yep. all going to get the break. All going to get it. And in fact, what do you think is really the case rate right now for this BA2 variant? Because nobody's reporting their home antigen test. Nobody's, nobody's even much testing. higher than what it is. It's yeah. way higher. And yet our hospitalizations are flat, declining, yeah. deaths are declining. So the actual outcome that we want is there. You know, and I, I want to go back to that, like, um, I, cause I think that this is something that, um, people have said, and I guess like, um, it's the idea of flatten the curve, which is like, we should implement these things. So we prevent the hospitals from being overcrowded, et cetera. Right. I guess I want to say like, when you're, you're three of the pandemic, like one, you need to build a hospital that you can kind of <laughs> handle a little excess in a time. Yeah, exactly. You might get that Surge. surges. You might get that in the winter Two, How much can you suppress normal life? because you're worried about hospital capacity. Right, right. And and then three, the reality is like most of the places that were like totally shut down in 2020, it wasn't about hospital capacity. Like uh, their hospitals were mostly empty. That's why we had a bailout for hospitals because there wasn't a surge everywhere. There's just a few cities that were really hit. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah. I would even say this, you wanna help hospital capacity, yeah. try to help unload the mental health no, crisis in the ER by uh, opening up 
because the pandemic made all of that worse by creating social isolation, anxiety, and all and of firing that. all these doctors and nurses yeah, for who, vaccine mandates. Right. And they didn't get a booster, they get fired. Right. No, what about that? I mean, you had to hold your nose and get a booster. I did. I right. Had to do it. By the way, so Paul no, Offit just wrote. Me. I uh, saw that New England Journal commentary. New England Journal thing. It's good. It's really good. He you basically. Think if I had printed that off and sent it to them, I could have gotten out of my booster. <laughs> yeah. Look, Paul Offit says. I'm sure that we'd love to see compelling data for severe disease prevention in young, healthy people that you're compelling a booster for. Yep, I think this goes to show you the age old truth, which is you can't let stupid people make mandates. No, you can't <laughs> let, you can't let, I mean, mandates are, you need to be very cautious and booster mandates for 20 year olds is a mistake. It's a, and mistake. It's a mistake made all over the place. Just wasting your juice. You're wasting your public health juice and you're, you're creating mistrust. It. Creating Just, mistrust. Yeah, that's all it is. So guess what's coming up though? Five to 11 year olds, no, FDA is weighing in on a booster for them. Based on antibody data? Yeah. And I thought but the based first on a two, tiny study with antibody data. And the first two is not even working so good for them. Their breakthroughs are going through the roof. <laughs> yeah. The first two had like vaccine effectiveness in a new New York State study of like eleven percent or something like that. I, you know, I think and Offit was right in the article to say, you know, why are we even calling these breakthroughs? This is what this vaccine is designed to do: is yeah, prevent severe like, disease. Yeah, yeah. He that well, well, you know, to but I'll push back on Offit yeah, a little yeah. bit. Okay. Well, one, I agree with him. I think he's right. That's what it was. Uh, that's what it ought to have been designed to do. Right. But if it if it was goal was always severe disease. They should have made the primary endpoint of the original randomized control ah, trial severe, severe disease. Severe disease, but they made it infection. They made it symptomatic infection. Yeah, symptomatic infection. So it wasn't asymptomatic infection. That's right. And also they purposely, I'm not, I don't say purposely. Let me take that back. I take back the word purposely. <laughs> they happened to not do asymptomatic swabbing on everyone in That's random. right. I remember that. Because that would have provided a lot of information about transmission. That's right. That's right. So we couldn't say in those early days, oh, does this vaccine actually implement uh, transmission declines? We had like a subset analysis from Moderna that right. found very low swab positivity, but we didn't have like the gold standard. Right. But and that it, was with Wuhan strain. Yeah, Wuhan strain. Right. And right. by the way, this is the same old mRNA, huh? They never want to change that. So, okay, that brings me up to another thing that Paul mentioned in his piece, which is original antigenic sin. Mm -hmm. And what that is for people who don't know. Yeah. Now, this is now, by the way, this has been co-opted by the sort of fringe anti-vaccine community. Right. So let's just put that out there that, listen, don't, it's not what you, what like they say. But just because some crazy person said it doesn't mean it's not true. That's all, right. Yeah, I mean, there's That's a kernel right. of truth in it. Because yeah. there's going to be crazy people who are like, the asteroid's coming. But then there may actually be an asteroid coming, yeah, right? right? Yeah. Course, so yeah. the, the, the original antigenic sin is where the immune system kind of imprints on the first version of uh, the viral antigen that it sees. And so we've given it that in the form of either natural infection with Wuhan strain or with the vaccine. Now, when you keep showing it the same strain, yeah. it's gonna imprint so, and they actually did some data on this, they, they updated the strain to be an Omicron yeah, yeah, antigen. Yeah. And when they tested it versus the original yeah. uh, thing, they both developed the same number of antibodies. And it might be because the system is already imprinted on the original and you're not gonna do better now. Yeah, and yeah. I think like when, I think I listened to Paul say this on your podcast, which was, <clears throat> you know, they learned with HPV, they originally had the quadrivalent and they went to the non-avalent from like four to nine. That's right. And if a girl had never gotten the nine and got the nine, She's got antibodies to all nine. Right. But if the girl had gotten the four yeah. quadrivalent HPV antigen and then the nine, she would make very robust again to the four and not as good for the not other as five. Good to the nine. That's the other an five, right? Antigenic yeah. sin, sin or, or imprinting. imprinting. That that and and so the question then becomes why do we keep flogging? Well, well yeah. it actually becomes a couple questions. Yes. One is would an updated vaccine then be helpful for people who've already had the original? Correct, with a different structure. With a different structure, because it may not be because original yeah. antigenic, you know, you might as well just use the same one. And the second question is why even use the same one if it's not gonna do anything for Correct. severe disease, so. So like, oh right, there's two questions, yeah. right? What is the goal? And right. then two, like what is the immunological response? Right. And then the other point to make is that like, I mean, like the spike protein is slightly different with Omicron. Right. And what happens if you give an Omicron only mRNA, it's possible you have a rev up of the antibodies that hit the epitopes that are preserved between the two. That's right. But not sort of all the novel epitopes. That's right, the new stuff, yeah. The new stuff. Um, and these are all good questions. They're good but, questions. You know, let me tell you something. You ever you ever get to that point where you're like, you know, I don't want to go grocery shopping. I just got to use up whatever's in my freezer. Oh yes. And I think Pfizer's at that point. <laughs> <laughs> we got to use up all this. Oh got all this, man. Give them four, maybe five doses. I don't know. But I, we got to use up this. You shit. may be onto something. I there. don't know why they're doing this stupid. So How bad does Pfizer feel that they that they thought you know, Paxlovid's going to be this big blockbuster and no, make it, no one wants to use it though. 
I think, uh, well, you, no, there people want to use it. Um, no, no, uh, sorry. Uh, people want to use it, oh, but it's, it's actually not, not being used that much. Oh, yeah. well, I say, but I think that they've already sold it and they got the cash. Uh, Didn't they sell that, it to the federal government? They, they I, I heard that like- I know the federal government bought a ton of it. Yeah yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I saw this graph of like Pfizer's earnings this year. Oh my God. Top about a hundred billion. Oh my God. You know, I just make out my tax check straight to Albert Borla. Might as well. Might as well. <laughs> so, dear just Al. write it right, dear Al. <laughs> yeah. I was like, and then in the notes it says, I say, thanks for dose number eight. <laughs> Yeah, that's in the nose, right? Yeah. Dose eight. Dose you're, eight. You're hoping you can write it off your HSA, yeah. which you have because you don't have universal coverage <laughs> for healthcare. And then I have to put my, my trope, one, zero point oh, zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> my troponin just bumped ever so slightly. I might be trope. reaching the asymptote of that last booster <laughs> that I need. Am I fully vaccinated? Well, what's your troponin? Fully vaccinated is always however many you've had plus one. Plus one. <laughs> oh, is it? No, no, no. You're good. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's an asymptote that you never reach. So we did the Eric Adams. We did the travel mask. We talked about something like that. Oh, Ashish Jha on TV. Yes. So Ashish, it's, I just read an article where Ashish, <laughs> they were talking about Ashish and they were saying he's received very um, uh, warmly by the administration because he's so congenial and such a good communicator and so on. And he's now telling people he's very optimistic and he's saying, listen, guys, what we care about are hospitalizations and it's not about cases. So well, let's say. not panic about cases. So that's the last I understood about Ashish. Well, I'll say a, f a few things that I think won't get me in trouble. Um, <laughs> then don't say them. I say stuff that's going to get me yeah, in trouble. Okay. <laughs> it's the VPZD show. Well, I guess the first thing I would say is that like, you know, some people were like, it said like TV pundit becomes what at White House Council. Right, right. And they're like, oh, that's unfair. He's the dean of a public health school. Right. So I want to say like, he has like real credentials. Yeah. He has published many, many papers. Yep. Um, in top journals. Yep. He was a professor at Harvard. He ran the global health sort of group. And then he became the dean of the Brown School of Public Health. And that was all before the pandemic. That's right. And also a nice guy. And by all yeah. accounts, well, yeah. I don't know. I've never met him. Yeah, I, I know a lot of people who know him very well. We're connected on LinkedIn, but that, I don't I haven't met him. You connect on LinkedIn? Yeah, well, you know, back when I did LinkedIn, now LinkedIn just sits there and I have all these messages from people. Do you even check your LinkedIn? I'm like, why would I? I'm not a douchebag. I always get people who like, it's like, they want to connect with you on LinkedIn. I was like, dude, I don't even know how to log into LinkedIn. Yeah, dude, it, get the email. I know how to, I can't, well, anyway. LinkedIn is, a, you know how each social media has, and again, we won't get too distracted. Yeah, yeah. Each social media has its own flavor. Like TikTok is like dancey stupidity. Twitter is whatever it is. Yeah, and oh Facebook is like, you know, middle-aged women and and me. <laughs> and, 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 but, but, but LinkedIn is something special. It is pure business drivelly I, I just business I, speak I hate it and I, I tried say. to do it for a while when I was a business when I was Z-Dog MD LLC and I was having sponsors and all this and then I was like you know the minute I stopped doing that I felt so much happier yeah I can it's understand. just not me it's not me but anyways so Ashish. Are we about? Ashish. Ashish. okay so he's got like the credentials like to be a dean of public health and I think he got the job at Brown before he COVID even came like mm -hmm. I think he had already like agreed he would take the job mm -hmm. um if I recall correctly, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but like, I don't think it was COVID that helped him become the Dean. I think he was- No, like, I don't think okay. so. Yeah, I don't think so. Then though, I think we have to separate. If he had just, if he had never opened the Twitter app, he would still be the Dean of the Brown School of Public Health and he wouldn't be the COVID czar. Right. So I think that's a separate thing people don't follow. Like, yes, mm. he has qualifications, but he wouldn't be the COVID czar if he didn't tweet a lot. Right. And he tweeted a lot and he tweets in a certain way. You know, he has puts a lot of spaces in the- Oh, I haven't seen his tweet. Oh, he's got like a character. His tweet is like, it's always this long because oh, he puts lots of space. He's a space, space in there. He's a space bar man. Ah. Spa enter, enter man. He's he, an enter man. Uh, that, he's a specimen. He's a, a spechemin. <laughs> <laughs> a space man. <laughs> so he has his own tweets and he has his threads about everything. You know, okay. And then from the threads he got, and of course he's got the title, then he got invited to all these shows and he goes on the shows and he does his circuit and he's on the shows like all the time. And I read an article saying that he was like, like literally like on the shows for like tons of like, you know, yeah. quarter of the day is him like doing the shows, all the shows, CNN, MSNBC, all the, all the shows that like real people don't watch, but like elites watch, you know, <laughs> you're or, right. or you're forced to watch it. Or 70 year olds watch. Yeah. Like Marty was saying when, when they watch him on Fox, it's you're like, right. yeah. <laughs> he's like a rager in like West Palm Beach or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. he gets recognized in West Palm Beach yeah. all the time, right? Like exactly. Palm Beach or something, yeah, some retirement community. He's like, Marty, Marty! <laughs> <laughs> you know, here it's like, okay. so, all right. So Twitter got him on TV and TV got him in the eye of Biden. And then the other thing that I find is a little problematic is that he was a bunch, he's one of many doctors who received quote, uh, quote updates and announcements from the administration that were private uh, of like what might be coming down the pike. Um, and then in one instance, he wrote an op-ed like minutes after there was a policy change mm. that was very supportive. It was all ready to go. Yeah. But I think there's already something problematic happening which is that he was on Twitter. He likely had a lot of stuff in praise of the administration, some stuff critical of the administration. 
it seems like the administration reached out to him privately. They have private meetings. He gets to getting private updates. And the moment you do that, you're starting to be captured because right. it's like you want to please me because right. I'm the presidency. This right. is the office of the White House, and I'm telling you some of what you're saying is we like. Right. And some of what you say we don't like, that's fine. You know, you do you. But um, just remember some of what you're saying we like. So what do you want to say next, you know? I mean, it's a, you know, I don't have to pressure you. Yeah. You will start to say what I like because you know I'm going to be in touch with you. You like those updates and announcements? It helps you, doesn't it? So what are you going to say now? What are you going to say about my policies? So I think naturally his policies were more and more praiseworthy of the administration. Why do I think that's a problem? When people turn on the TV, they need to know that the person on that TV is not in cahoots with the person making the calls. Mm -hmm. I want the TV person who's a critical of it at least to be totally independent. I don't want it somebody who's like auditioning for Trump or Biden. Right, which of course is not, it's not how it works. They are all doing that. Yeah, they're all playing it, they're this all bullshit They're all playing game. this game. Well, this is the bullshit game. Okay. It uh, is. No, but that, yeah. that's actually, this is a point and you actually made that a, same point. I don't know what you have against Indian physicians working in the administration. <laughs> but I mean, Vivek Murthy, you were saying- like, I'm an equal opportunity critic. You are. Yeah. I, no one will ever accuse you of racial nepotism. No, I'm an yep. equal- No. Equal opportunity. In fact, I mean, let's see, who did who we talk about today? We talked about Ashish. I just said Vivek. Um, Liana Wen, who yeah. is a, a, a woman of color. So we're just basically racist. We're just attacking the people president, of color. The president, Trump. Trump, he's pretty white. Yeah, he's white. No, so we attack white people too. Oh, okay, good, good, I mean, good. Okay, so yeah, we're, we're equal opportunity. We're, we're equal opportunity. All right, good, yeah, good, right. good. All right, good. I was getting nervous. No, no, I, I, <laughs> do, I don't see race when I see problems. I see the specific problem. The problem is, the problem is, it doesn't matter, you know, who this person is. The problem is that um, there's a problem here. That it, it, it'll lead to the auditioning. Yeah, it will lead to the auditioning. Well, so yeah. let me ask a question, then I'll play devil's advocate. Do you think doctors who care about stuff? Uh, and and you would fall in this, shouldn't do their thing on Twitter. No, you should, but you can't let yourself be captured. Mm. And you have to be careful you're not auditioning for somebody. I mean, I don't know. I don't know who I would be auditioning for. Right. Because I don't have- Well, for you, you'd much be basically auditioning for anti-vaxxers because we know who you are. <laughs> you're a hater. I mean, that, yeah. Was, well, I think that's different. I mean, well, not that I, not that I, would say, I would say it's different um, in this respect. Um, well, first of all, I'm not auditioning for anti-vaxxers. Yeah, <laughs> okay, well, yeah let's as, just put I'm, that out there. I'm yeah. as pro-vax as they come. Uh, but I'm a smart person who understands numbers, so that's why I think about safety and risk and uncertainty. And that's what some of these anti-vaxxers, -anti these zealots, don't understand because they've lost their minds and they are not really sort of scientists. But um, like auditioning for an audience, like they might say like you're auditioning for the Z-Pac. Right. And it's like, well, the Z-Pac is, who is the Z-Pac? It's like thousands of people that randomly like you for, I don't know, your views on meditation or views on vaccine or your views on this or your views on that, or for just the way you talk and the way you present yourself. They like you for whatever reason, you don't even know. It's and the shape of my head. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, what it is, it's not those early videos. No, <laughs> Not those early videos. Oh, you know how to hurt me. That's it. That's it. No, my, my daughter grabbed my head, my 10-year-old this morning, and she said, your head looks like to me like a potato. <laughs> and I was like, that's pretty accurate. Anyways, you're right. So the Z-Pack, yeah. Yeah. I mean, capture. You know, I don't know. Is it capture? I mean, it would be capture if you were like really, I don't know, maybe, maybe if you were known for some perspective or issue and if you feel like compelled to talk about that issue to grow your brand or audience. Right. Um, as maybe some people are. Yeah. But I don't think you fit that bill. But also I think it's different than people who are trying to please a specific part, political party or political person. Right. Because if you're on TV, you want to please the White House because they'll give you a job. Right. ZPAC now can give you no job. No <laughs> I mean, way. I mean, they, actually they, they support our show to a degree. Uh -huh, so but, I could be captured by them. But it's like supported by like, like the way Bernie is supported by $5 that's payments. Right, that's right, that they're $5 payments. Right? Not, it's not like one person giving that's you right. $100 million. That's right. I mean, actually, this is worth isn't... really diving in. Yeah, no, because this idea of capture is actually a huge problem, social media and beyond. So what you're talking about, and we're not saying, no one's saying Ashish is captured or anything like that. You're just saying that. Except, that, well, no, I was, no, I was hinting it. No, I, and I don't think he's captured, but I do think he was in a bad cycle. That's right. right. That's right. And it certainly can give the appearance of that. Yeah. And the truth about capture is, and this is something that we no one talks about, except for my friend David Fuller on his podcast, Rebel Wisdom. The truth about capture is, you don't know your capture. You don't know your capture. It's an unconscious bias in many ways. Some people make it conscious. Like I've talked to some people who are on Twitter and stuff and they say, oh no, no, I, can't, I say these things because you know I'm really angling for a job in the White House or something like that. You know, I've, I've heard people say this. 
but, but that's overt. They, they are aware of it. They know exactly wow. what they're doing. Oh, the only people Shameless. they're misleading is the, is the public. Yeah. But they're not misleading themselves. The people I worry about more are the people who also mislead themselves. Like if you look at, yeah, and I'm gonna name, I'll name a name. So somebody like a, like a very smart guy like Brett Weinstein, right? Like he has grown a brand during COVID. He's done all this stuff during COVID by saying certain very contrarian things about vaccines. And and his audience absolutely loves that. Mm -hmm. Now, whether you know it or not, that capture of validation and views and money, because yeah, yeah. there is, there's Patreon, there's all the other stuff, it it, it does can capture you. Now let's think about like, um, okay, so there's like three things, three tiers of capture. Our three, three tiers we're talking about. One tier is a speaker or actor is speaking or acting in a way for a very small but powerful audience. Ah. Okay, so that's what I'm saying that job might be falling into, or right. at least we should be cognizant that what our media Twitter ecosystem is doing is creating such a potential. Right. Like there'll be a future person who will be for working for whatever future president we have a Republican president, and they'll be going on TV saying things that they hope they like. And right. In fact, a lot of people they accuse that like that's how Trump found them. They're like, watch them right. on TV. Right. D and and Dr. Oz has been accused of that. Right. And he's shifted a lot on his things that he said and based now that on he got the endorsement. Now he, now he got an endorsement. Yeah. He got the big. Yep. The letterhead. The big T. The big T. Um. Uh, and there's doctors who will like take money from Celgene and then say good things about Celgene products and right. take money from Celgene. These are like very small entities with a strong like interest. Yeah. And they can capture this person with like a lot of money. Yeah. Um, okay. So that's one type of capture. That's a capture I'm like really most worried about. Yeah. The next capture is the capture you're talking about, like this Brett Weinstein, uh, this capture where somebody's views may be pulled by not just like not by one rope, but by lots of rope, but like thousands of people who happen to hold a group, like a kind of view. Right. And I guess the question I have would be like one: you should you should always ask yourself like, are you taking that stand because you feel like the audience is pulling you there? Right. Two: if you took the stand that you really want to, might there be a different audience? Like you know, we always you know you don't have to keep saying the same shit you said yesterday to have an audience. You they might you might find there'll be different people who are drawn to you. Yeah. Um. And then the third thing that's what I'm talking about, which is where I think, you know, you and I fall, is that we do talk about a range of different things. Right. You know, like my show has got all that boring bullshit that you, Hell yeah. that you don't listen to. <laughs> yeah, and the boring bullshit I say is like, hey, let's all meditate ourselves into oblivion. Yeah. And you have a range of different topics. Right. And it's shifted over your 10 years, that's too. Because right. you sure weren't has. into meditation that much back no, then. No, 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 no. The audience has gone with you. Right. Because in part, what you are- At least at, some of them, yeah. At least some of right? And there's right. different people. Yeah. And so I think that's very different. And it's the same thing with like political donations. Wouldn't it be more problematic if, you, if it turns out that like, I don't know, Bill Clinton was entirely supported by big agriculture right. and he signed an agriculture bill. Right. Versus Bernie is supported by, you know, 1.5 million people who hold certain views, some of which you agree with, some of which you don't agree with. Well, it's know? like Cor Cory Booker when they were talking about importing drugs from, uh, re-importing from Canada or oh, whatever. and he took all that he pharma took all money. that pharma money because he's in New Jersey, which is the big pharma central. Pharma capital. And uh, you so know, I everybody like was that. like, what? Yeah. But that, I mean, that's direct capture. That's capture. Whereas we're talking about subtle level, levels of capture. Yeah, I mean, you know, and, and you know, people, I, I think that this is something that requires introspection too, to even mm -hmm. think that it's possible for you if it's unconscious. Uh, Sam Harris is a good example of someone who does not get easily captured. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so, right. Because so, he keeps changing up his, his topics. Yeah he, yeah, he changes topics, but he's also quite consistent. His audience, because he's a bit of an intellectual dark web guy, so he is a contrarian on a lot of stuff. Um, when his audience, his audience then starts to enrich in these folks. Like what he found, like this was a good example. He found that a bunch of tr uh, real strong Trump supporters were starting to, to be in his audience because he was saying things like very negative about Hillary Clinton. You know, he really doesn't like the Clintons and he's quite authentic about it. But then like his audience started being filling with like these pro-Trump people. Uh, then he said and something then Trump. he basically said, listen, you guys, you guys are idiots. Like mm -hmm. if you think this guy's a good, a good president and he just chokes that aspect wow. of the audience yeah. and just tries to guide it to wherever he thinks it ought to be. So that, now that requires a degree of- Wait, let's, and then let's flip the whole coin because we're talking about people who are in sort of the public space. Right. But this is true even to people who are in totally private space. So, oh, like yeah, I know yeah, yeah. like a doctor who's a researcher um, they know if they say certain things or have certain views on certain issues, they're gonna get more grant funding. That's the uh, hot topic. Those right. are the hot topics. And they Equity. may be, uh, <laughs> that, that might be one. Right. And I think there's a lot of important things to do there, but I also think there are ways in which it can be cliched and repetitive and like sure, not sure, very productive. Sure. Yeah. Um, and, but even like stupid things like, I don't know, intracellular kinase, some bullshit mm. that we don't even, you know, they have like a strong point of view about it or, or genomics. That was a hot topic. Mm. 
And so they can become trapped in that. And then they very quickly can come to say things that they're like, oh yeah, I don't really think it's that promising, but that's where the grant money is. And it's a type of authenticity. They're not an authentic scientist. Oh. They're authentic, you know? Oh, and so capture in academics and in research. Absolutely. By what the journal likes. They're like, oh, the journal's like this. I better totally. go into that space. Totally. Where the grant money is, certain um, tumor types or certain even pathways or certain ideas. When Varmus was famously in charge of the NIH, he discovered RAS, some oncogene, yeah. and he really wanted to drug RAS. And there was like a disproportionate funding to drug RAS than there was other targets, of course. I remember like, RAS. RAS. Yeah, yeah those those uh, tumor suppressor genes. Is that what RAS is? RAS is an oncogene. Oncogene, that's yeah. right. But there that's are right. also tumor suppressors. Yes, that's right. It's an oncogene. P53 is a tumor suppressor. Correct. See, I, I remember nothing from and college. now you're 50% the way there. <laughs> You think I can get a grant? Very, those are very important. Oh, yeah, good, good, Well, good. here's how you'd get a grant. You'd say, like, our novel and innovative and put all this. That's right. You got to put that LinkedIn word vocabulary in That's there. That's right. Get that LinkedIn vocabulary. That's right. Actually, what, what I studied in college for my honors thesis in genetics was integrin-mediated cell-cell adhesion pathways, mm. which were important in cancer. Tight. It was felt to be, yes. <laughs> and so what we did was we mutated um, Drosophila fl fruit flies so that they developed blisters in their wings, which I would screen for. And then we'd run the gels on them to see if see. there were any integrin associated pathway mutations. Hence your college nickname, Lord of the Flies. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I've got the conch piggy. I'm the one who speaks. Lord Where are my glasses? Flies. Where are my glasses, Where piggy? Where are my glasses? <laughs> oh, I've got the conch. Gosh. <laughs> if you were a kid growing up today, you wouldn't get that reference because you'd never read a book. You know, it's now true. You look at your phone. My daughter read Lord of the Flies twice, actually, because she just thought it was so powerful. It's a powerful book. Yeah, she's a dark child. I don't want to read 1984 again because I'm afraid I'll Dude, see it in the mirror. It is bad news. You Wait, know? back to the teach job. Oh, yeah, back yeah. to the story. Okay, so close this out. We'll close out the authentic. So I guess the lesson is the first thing is like you got to be authentic. Yeah. Two, you have to avoid like real capture. Right. I think Ashish was in this problematic thing. Um, I don't know how he's going to do, but so far, extending uh, airplane mask mandate, veto I vetoed that decision. Yeah. He was on Fox News yesterday. They asked point blank, Dr. Ja, what do you think about masking young children? And he said, oh, I trust the AAP and CDC because they're the experts here. Oh dear. I said, strike two. Yeah. It's not good because the WHO disagrees and the data is crappy. Yeah. And I think he is smart enough to know how crappy the data is. Yeah. So then it smells to me too political. We'll see how he does. Yeah. But I'll be on him. If he does good, you know what? If he says the things I like to hear and that by like to hear, I mean like scientifically based right. and factual. I was going to say, yeah, yeah. Because that's what I like. Yeah. Not like my point of view, which happens to be that. But if he says what I like, because it's factual and accurate, then he'll earn my blessing. I like uh, the word you said, which is authenticity. That's what yes. I like to see. I like to see authenticity. You can feel it in people. It's funny. I think that's part of the reason Trump, for all his yes. pluses and minuses, for all his plus and minuses, he was Trump. Yeah. You knew what you were getting there. You're Sometimes like, when he like says something that's like, it's just what he was thinking. Yeah. And you're like, you know, Americans actually do respond to authenticity. Especially uh, when the like the opposite candidate is like feels very inauthentic. Feels inauthentic. I I, w I remember when I was watching the debate um, uh, when Trump and Biden, and I was watching them both, and Biden looked like a mask of a politician, you know, kind of reciting the the stuff, and Trump was just there, just being an asshole. And I'm like, that's authentically who he is. He's an asshole, whereas Biden's being this character, yeah. right? And and I honestly think that like, I think Biden is worried that like when in his youth, he was more himself and he said things and then he like the, the quote unquote gaffes. Yeah. And so he doesn't want to be there again. Yeah. But I actually think that if he was really more himself, people might even people like him like better. Like him more, yeah. yeah. Like him more. I, I, I think you're right. There, there is an authenticity thing. And, and, and you know, that word authenticity can, can become cliche too. Correct. Okay. But the truth is, you know, one of the things that, you know, my friend Angelo DeLulo says, the physician who uh, we do some meditation videos and stuff, awakening videos, he says something that happens as you go down the path is that you become more and more authentic, actually. You become who you are without filters more. And it doesn't mean you go hurting people by insulting them and you know, saying exactly what you think and so on. It's just, you're more true to what you are without all the obfuscation. And um, I think there's something there. But I wonder if you think this, like, uh, you know, that being able to be authentic in America in 2022 is a luxury that very few oh, people get. yeah, you're right. Because like, let's say you work yeah. in some regular job, you are not be able to have a podcast where you actually say what you think about no. anything. But remember but, that woman from Levi's, they fired her? She was, got, uh, did you see this article? No, I didn't. She was like in line to be the next president of the Levi's Corporation. Mm. And then she tweeted, it was originally covered in Barry Stack's Substack, mm. and then it moved over to the New York Times. Barry Weiss, yeah. Bar sorry, Barry, mm. Barry Weiss's Substack. And um, she 
had worked for Levi's and she started tweeting that school closures was a bad idea. Mm. And Levi's gradually put the squeeze on her, squeeze on her, squeeze on her, and then fired her. Wow. Um, and then she made an excellent point, which was that her colleagues were also tweeting on political issues, including George Floyd and things like that. But it was for the other side, um, presumably. Right. Um, and although, they had no problem. And they had no problem with that. Yeah. And then also, I think school closure really, the, the sides got flipped. It was the progressives who forgot what their goals were and their right. philosophy is, okay, so that's right, another issue. Right, right. Um, and I think she identifies as a progressive too. And, uh, but she was fired. And I think like so many people, you know, cause I'm always uh, like, I always criticize social media. I'm like, look at all these anonymous, these anonymous yeah. accounts. Like an egg, yeah. A yeah, anonymous accounts. And then somebody was like, well, you know, you have to be anonymous, you work in my job. If anyone saw any of these posts, like, you know, <clears throat> so I do feel bad. Oh, that's a, so this is a good point. Now yeah. this is just talking about expressing your opinions on things and your views in a public space. But like, even like the person working in that job, what if they are authentically them in the job? Meaning, mm -hmm. okay, this is my aptitude and I am me in my most honest expression in this space. That's probably 90% of the battle. That other 10% of like, well, there are other beliefs and so on. So it is interesting. Because in medicine, I think many of us are inauthentic. Of course. I mean, it's just conditioned into us. Don't don't be who you are. Be who they you think the patients want or who the administrators want or who your boss wants. Who the graders want. I mean, yeah. most of it, like the first 10 years are grading. Right. It's all attendings. You're just kissing the ring, right? And then the goal is like one day you'll be the ring that's kissed. So it's okay. Just kind of suck it up. And then you can inflict it on others. Yeah. But then what happened was the culture changed. And now that- yeah. now, now that, you can't even do now, that. No, no, no. Now that like people come up and they're all qu question you so hard. Oh, like, hey, listen, easy. <laughs> that's true. That's true. It has shifted. It has now shifted. it's like the attendings are targets. It's Our like, generation, we like paid, we paid, we paid up and then we pay down. Yeah, <laughs> it's really true. I think that's why, you know, that, we, 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 we could probably get some understandable criticism for being a little hard in that way because we did have to pay up. We did. Yeah, we had to kiss the ring, kiss the ring, kiss the ring. Now it's less the case. I had to listen to say people say like things that were like just factually an error, and I was like, oh, you know, I think they're like, yeah. I was like, you know, maybe you think about it, like as polite as I possibly could. They're like, no, and I was like, mm, all right, I'll suck it up. Now that kid would like they'd have a blog about how they're attending a, a <laughs> dipshit, and you know, and they'd get social credit for doing that. Oh, you knocked down. No, you're you're speaking truth to power. You know, I do think that they're in for a rude awakening because everybody will eventually get older, and then they'll be knocked down by the newer. And I think we've already seen in some organizations that live on tearing down. Yeah, they just get tore down themselves. Yeah, it's a you know even the Facebooks and stuff like their employees run the show in some way. You yeah, know, they're all upset about Elon and Twitter and. Right. It's like, dude, it. dude. <laughs> yeah, but back to, I guess, how does it connect to the Ashish? I mean, I guess I'd say that, you know, he shouldn't have said that thing about the masking kids. I don't know yeah. why he did. And, well, uh, what we'd like to see is just the honesty. You know, it's funny if, if like whatever Leanna Wen just said, if our public officials would have been saying that. I'd love to interview, I'd love to interview her because yeah. if, she, if you're listening, she, um, because she did really a 180, in my opinion, on these policy issues. She was very, in, in December of 2021, she said, we may, I think she wrote an op-ed, we may need to proactively shut yeah. down schools for Omicron. I remember that. And now yeah. she's the other way around. Right. It'd be interesting to talk to her because I'd love to get also, and we're connected actually, we, we've met before mm. and we're connected, but I don't know her well, but I'd say that, I'd like to ask her about Planned Parenthood. Oh, what, yeah. happened what happened there? I, I, I mean, I, I would love, but know. you know, the thing is again, like how much authenticity can a public figure actually show about these kind of things publicly? That's always the thing. And especially if like there's ongoing legal, issues. I don't know. Do I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, then you can't say anything. Yeah. So mm -hmm. see this, and this is the thing, you and I have talked about this, this idea of authenticity when you're interviewing someone, like I've had people on the show that will not be themselves, will not be the person they are before the show starts. They, they go, they put on a mask and I, and hate that. I hate it so much that I will, it's almost stopped me from interviewing people to a degree. Like how many interviews do I do? There's a rotating cast of characters mm -hmm. that I have. You find who you like. And I find who's authentic. Like it's you, like if Jay bot wanted to come back yeah. on, I know who Jay bot is. Right. You may disagree with what he's saying, but he is Jay bot And old man Marty. Old man Marty. <laughs> is this soup fresh? What's going on? And so, where'd you get your juice? And, where is it, was, and the oranges come from? Are they free range oranges? <laughs> Florida. <laughs> <laughs> Marty, Monica, you, yeah. Jay, you know, these are people that I know are this gonna be This is something that no, no one in the audience, unless you've actually done an interview show, will be sympathetic to, but no. It's really, it's really powerful. It's really powerful yeah. how true it is that like you get at somebody who doesn't want to talk and it's so painful. It's so painful. It's, it's so like painful. you can't you can't get the time back for yourself.
yourself. You can't get the brain cells back. And you missed an opportunity, you feel, to to really... It's like a woodworker and you get the delivery for the wrong product. You, get oh. the, you can't even start, you can't even do, you can't even build a table. That's not the right wood. You ah, like yeah, 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 yeah. So why even bother? You know, because I've had, I've had people tell me, Z, why don't you interview some more mainstream COVIDian voices and so on? And I go, because I, I know who they are. They are not going to tell you what they really think. That's the other problem. Yeah. And then I also think that a lot of people are like, this is another cultural thing where it's like, I don't want to go on and be challenged about my views. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, then next. Yeah. 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 They're like, I don't want any tough questions or right. I don't want to talk for more than 10 minutes. And, and, and the truth, yeah. And the truth is like, you know, I have all kinds of PR companies reaching out to me. We have a perfect guest for your show. They've written this New York Times selling book. And I look at it and I go look and I watch some of their videos. I'm like, this is the most inauthentic piece of shit I've ever seen. And some of them are in, in spiritual circles too, like big heads of like things. Really? That, yeah. You know, and you're just like, no. So then I guess the question I have is like, um, what do you think motivates them? Like, I mean, I, I understand somebody who like, you can tell they like, they have a point of view. They want to get their point of view across right. and, um, you know, um, and, 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 and they are willing to be open about their point of view. That's why they're doing it. But what motivates somebody to want to be an influencer and then not want to be themselves? Uh, yeah, I really think it's a narcissism. It's like mm. a fake, um, mask they put on to protect their own insecurity that they're not good enough. You know, I mean, and, and look, as somebody who continually suffers from general imposter syndrome, you do, ah, I do, but. But, you know, and I've talked about this on the show, but I, I'd say that I do and I don't. I know who I am. Mm -hmm. So when I suffer imposter syndrome, it's, it's, a, it's a feeling that I'm not doing what I, I'm not doing as good as I really should. Like, I know I can do better. I don't think that's not imposter syndrome. It's not true imposter okay. syndrome. The true imposter, sometimes I get real imposter syndrome where I'm like, dude, I have no business. Like, I can't believe I'm asked to weigh in on this. Well, you know, I want to push on this. I feel like a lot of people are talking to me about imposter syndrome. Yeah, and yeah. like some of them, I'm like, you know, you have imposter syndrome because I was like, you got some stuff to work on. I was like, because <laughs> <laughs> like, you don't know all You're the- actually an imposter. Well, right? yeah. I yeah. mean, like- Oh, I that's mean, a good point. I mean, I think people like, you know- I, mean, I think it's definitely the case. Yeah, yeah. Like, I don't know how to tell you. It's like kindly, but like- we all, when we, when anyone starts any field or any craft, you're not the good at it. Right. You're, you're not as good as you could be. Right. Because you haven't started it. From medical knowledge, you don't know a lot, to, I don't know, even the art of the gab, you know? Yeah. I think we do better than we did when the first time I came here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's I was, actually, oh, we should... We should link to our first interview. No, oh God, it'll be yeah, terrible. Let's not, let's not, let's not. You could link to it. I'm curious. Yeah. Whoever, I I whoever you talk to, one of them had a lot of hair. <laughs> Yeah, you look like Bigfoot. It was great. It was pandemic. I got a haircut. In like yeah, eight. actually, we did a Zoom interview even before that. Didn't oh yeah, we? about oncology. That yeah. was even that was yeah. worse because well, we didn't even know each other and yeah, we'd never met in and person. You should never have a Zoom talk. With us. Zoom is the worst. I know. I've done. I mean, I do a lot of Zoom interviews, but it's you like have to very yeah. technical, technical like, stuff, right? Like on my like we can have this, but well, you and I of course have a rapport now, so right. we can do a lot. But more, anybody but, in a physical space, the rapport goes up exponentially. Course, yeah. It just goes up exponentially. Plus, you get to hang out a little before, a little after in person, yeah. and the way the words fall on the, you know. Absolutely. Like, you know, Offit is one of the only people I interview by Zoom now. And the reason I do it is we had an in-person back in the day and we developed that connection oh, and rapport. Yeah, yeah, if, yeah. if I didn't have that and it was only Zoom, I don't know that we'd have the same interaction. Well, I, in, I have interviewed a bunch of people because like to talk about their publication or something, which right. is more kind of structured. Right. I mean, what were we saying a second ago? That was, oh, on this uh, imposter syndrome. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I guess the one thing I want to tell people is like, who are suffering from imposter syndrome, like, yes, part of it could be like a, uh, a misplaced feeling, mm -hmm. but the other part is like, you could be potentially there's room for you to improve. And so you'll feel more confidence. Right. I think that's true in medicine a lot because like a lot of people feel an imposter when they just don't know what to do next. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, um, uh, or they think they know, but they don't really feel that confidence that they know because they may not, you know. And I think that's part of like medical training. Um, yeah. But then the other part is a misplaced. Yeah, misplaced, yeah. There is a valley in sort of the Dunning-Kruger curve where you know a little, you overestimate what you know, but then as you learn more, you reach that valley where imposter syndrome becomes real because you realize how much there is to know and, and how impossible it is to know it all. But then as your confidence improves, the imposter syndrome maybe. It's made, there's a component of it because you still know there's more to learn, but you actually, you're confident, but you overestimate what other people know. So this is something that's been looked at. It's like, they, they tend to go, well, you know, we don't need to talk about that because everybody knows that. It's like, yeah. no, I, I don't. feel like I make that mistake sometimes in my videos and I stuff. I do it. yeah. Assume, but you know, one thing I think about is like, especially with these papers on like vaccine safety and stuff. And I interviewed this woman who like is like a specialist in it. And I was just like, 
I see these people on Twitter and they're like, you know, so critical of the stuff that I've said about myocarditis and others. And I just want to say, you're totally wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you're totally wrong. You should have imposter syndrome because you're in over your head. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't analyze data like this for a living. I don't think, I think you have, you're, you're turning science into this like popularity contest based on what like your political friends think. And I was like, you're doing such a disservice to science. I was like, shut up. Yeah, dude. <laughs> is that bad? <laughs> no, this is why, this, that, that's authenticity. That's exactly how you feel about it because you do this for a living. I know. Yeah. And I'm like. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's like, idiot. okay, okay. I'll, 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 okay, what do I do for a living now? I do this, right? So here's when people tell me, you ought to do this on social media or you know, you should do this or that. I'm like, you have no effing clue what you need to do on social media oh, because yeah. you, you're just, you're trying to move these icons and play this game that it's not a game. The and game is be your authentic self, deliver something people really want yeah. and the rest of it just clicks. Well, like at every academic like medical conference, they always have a panel on like how to use social media. Yeah, those are the and, best. And they, they find people who like have no competence. Just the <laughs> worst. Or, or these social media consultants. <laughs> yeah. like, and I was like they, they can't even get their own account to I do anything. No, it's like PR companies. Like, what do you do exactly? I don't even get it. Are you kidding? Like you cold reach out to random podcast hosts and try to get your dipshit guest with a terrible book so sad on a show that is not even going to reach the audience that matters to them so sad yeah it's just it's really depressing 10 lessons for social media and you're like <laughs> who is writing this four reasons children are mentally ill oh wait i just did that <laughs> oh, <I don't> know. <laughs> no it's true it's true and and, and uh i don't know again it, it cuts to just just get good at something that you know is authentically what you care about and then talk about it yeah and be you and talk about yeah. you and then um and also and don't have anxiety about things that are like so far outside of your, yeah, your ability. The to do, world, the and, world. You yeah. can't be anxious. I mean, I'm anxious about those like four to do list items yeah. I have for today, and the four yeah, thousand I have for this week. There's something to be said for uh, proximal busyness. You know? Proximal, yeah. yeah. You know, just get busy on something that you care about. Oh, that that and that reminds me of the kids' mental health thing. The kids now are so over scheduled and over structured. They're doing a bunch of activities. That was the other piece to get into college, that it's this arms race, mostly among affluent people. Like Bay Area, it's exactly like this. They're all hyper-scheduled. They have the soccer and they have violin and they have a, a Spanish tutoring and they have this. And so the kids are like in this weird bubble where they're actually quite lonely and overworked and underslept, but they're not actually doing anything that's of value. <laughs> it, like free play or going out and socializing with kids in the neighborhood until mm -hmm. the streetlights come on where they learn like real skills, like how to deal with a bully or how to... How to properly bully others. Then I like, I learned that early on. Yeah. Like, I don't care if I'm short, I'll bully the crap out of you. <laughs> I'll find what's weak about you and I'll just pound, I'll drill on it. <laughs> it's a gift tone with time. It is. It All is. right, I got to run because, yeah. and I hate when people say that at the end of the show. No, but it's true. But I do have to run because some this person wants to have a phone call here. Uh, I think we actually did a thing though. That's good. Um, yeah, this was fun. We so. hit all the things on my little list. Yeah, look at that little thing. See, ever since I got this little pad, yeah. the show has gotten structured. It went up AF. a notch. It went up three notches. <laughs> and my imposter syndrome just plummeted through plummeted. the bottom. Now I'm full Dunning-Kruger. Well, we Kruger. should talk more about this. Imposter syndrome, anxiety. Yeah, we'll do another show on this. Do another show, these kids. Because I was also think, thinking like all these activities I see young people do. Yeah, yeah. I was like, you know, the moment you turn like 22, yeah. you're never going to do any of those things again. None of it. I love soccer, but I, I, it's been 15 years since yep. I even played a single, you know. I played clarinet in middle school. Don't do you even, think I'm going to play a clarinet now? You, you got to cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to admit to these? Clarinet? Dude, I do. Why do you play clarinet? This one time in band camp? <laughs> Dude, it was, it was bad. I was a huge nerd, man. But anyway, I continue to be. Um, guys. You know what to do. This is the VPZD show. I'll put it out on the channel, oh, but yeah. you're going to put it out on Facebook. I'm going to no, put no, it No, no, maybe you put it. Well, we'll, yeah, see. we'll, we'll see. We'll, 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 see. we'll, we'll both see. do it. We'll both put it out. And it's going to be on the podcast. Subscribe on your favorite platform. Leave a review. It helps us you know, beat out Hidden Brain with what's his name? Shankar. Shankar. And Jetty? Is that his name? No, no Shankar Vedantam. That's, that's right. Sagar and Jetty. Sagar and Jetty. Well, I'm the Break. biggest Sagar fan. I Me love too. I love Sagar. I love Breaking Points. Breaking Points is Hidden Brain, no comment. Yeah, I don't know. I just don't <laughs> listen to it. Um, we love you, Ish, and we're out. Peace.